One of the keys in understanding this early evolution of Homo is trying to figure out this assortment of species or what evolutionary processes are giving rise to the variation that we see. These four specimens here, in some people's mind, would represent four separate species. Maybe Homo erectus, Homo georgicus, Homo rudolfensis, Homo habilis. In other people's views, they might represent a single lineage, maybe more habiline-like specimens that give rise gradually to more erectine-like specimens. And the evolution from Homo habilis to Homo erectus then is a fairly linear process. So the challenge or the key to sorting out this problem is thinking about what is the evolutionary model and what are the key evolutionary forces at play. For example, when we see differing morphology in specimens, is that the result of selection? Are those different morphologies really adaptations to specific environments? For example, changes in the, the masticatory apparatus associated perhaps with co-evolving changes associated with increasing brain size and the brain as an adaptation. Maybe the dentition themselves reflect an adaptation. Or alternatively, maybe the variation we're seeing is not selected variation, but neutral variation. Maybe the pattern of variation we're seeing is really the product of genetic drift operating on these populations. Keep in mind that with the beginning of the genus Homo, we certainly have small local population sizes. These are basic hunter-gatherers that have an old one technology, so they couldn't have been very large in terms of local population size. And yet they begin to spread out very rapidly, at least across large sections of the old world, which means that they would have been dispersed small-scale populations. Perhaps a perfect scenario for genetic drift to have a significant effect on local populations, creating different patterns of specific features across different geographically distinguished populations. So one challenge is then trying to figure out how to differentiate these two as a hypothesis. How might we differentiate selection leading to differential adaptation leading to a radiation of species versus genetic drift giving rise to neutral variation across different geographically distributed populations. And the way we try to do this is by setting up models about the pattern of variation we would expect to see across time and space. If this is a selected change across time giving rise to a radiation of lineages, we'd expect to see different kinds of correlated changes in the structures of the face, the structures of the neurocranium, maybe corresponding to differences in the postcranial morphology if part of the adaptation has to do with the energetics of movement and bipedality. In contrast, if we're arguing for genetic drift, again, we'd expect to see a different pattern. We'd expect to see changes that seem functionally neutral, that don't necessarily correspond with these specific directional changes associated with selection. So one way is to try and think quantitatively and mathematically about how selection versus drift would operate to produce changes. And the good thing is we have quantitative models for this. The secondary challenge is then putting them into a model where we have enough samples and we know enough about exactly when and where they're located from. One of the uncertainties is a specimen like Dimenisi, we have fairly good temporal control over. We know that it's coming from about 1.76 to maybe 1.78 million years of age. Other specimens, however, such as ER 1470 from East Africa, we've got less certainty as to exactly where it fits in in the temporal sequence. It could be even older than 2 million years of age. It could be maybe as young as 1.7 million years of age. Trying to distinguish why these two are different, given that temporal uncertainty is therefore a challenge. So much of the most important work done in this time period right now is actually geological and archaeological work associated with getting the direct dates and settings and context for these specimens. That temporal element matters when we're trying to differentiate models of evolution via natural selection versus evolution via genetic drift. But this is an important question and an important topic. We oftentimes disagree as paleoanthropologists about what we want to call things, but really what we call them is secondary. The primary thing is actually, what evolutionary forces do we think are important and how do we expect those forces to act? If we're arguing for selection and radiation across geographic space, that's one model, it's one way of viewing the pattern of evolution in early Homo. If you're arguing for genetic drift associated with isolation by distance across geographically separated populations, that's a different mindset for thinking about what evolutionary processes are important in the early evolution of our genus. So when you see, for example, that I might interpret these specimens in one way, and another paleoanthropologist might take a very different view, giving them different names, different species, multiple species. Don't necessarily think that we're wholly fundamentally opposed. Rather, we might be simply taking a different perspective as to either how to ask questions of the fossils, given the uncertainties that we have in them, or what are the important evolutionary processes at play.
For example, I might think that the key factor is selection on a large scale. So selection for something like bigger brain, something that would be universally advantageous, but coupled with genetic drift acting on locally isolated populations, giving rise to what are essentially neutral features that serve to distinguish one geographic population from another, but in the context of an overall pattern of increasing brain size. Another person might take those distinguishing features between two geographically distributed populations and see them as natural selection shaping one species one way and another species one way, given the differing environments they occupy. It's just a different way of trying to interpret how evolution is acting. It involves developing a different set of predictions and testing them differently. But taking a step back, whether we think of these four specimens as four separate species, or rather a single lineage evolving through time, there are a couple general characteristics of early Homo that are clearly evident. The first is that the evolution of larger brain size is really critical for the early appearance of Homo. Their brains are getting bigger, and this clearly seems to be a selected characteristic. Likewise, the dentition are getting smaller and the bodies are getting larger. These two might correspond again to that change in brain size in terms of differing ecology, differing diet. And finally, the increasing reliance on cultural technology, the ability to create something like a stone tool, modifying the environment to produce the tool, but a tool which self is going to be used to modify the environment and solve different environmental problems, potentially a whole multitude of them. So these factors together help dictate the overall pattern of evolution and that transition from Australopithecus to Homo. The transition from something that's fundamentally different to something that's fundamentally very much like we are today.